be opening your Bibles to Mark chapter 12. We'll be there in a few minutes. Mark chapter 12. We've always lived in a very problematic world. I mean, that almost goes really without saying. If you were to, if someone was to ask you, can you name, can you list five things on one hand, five problems with even our country in and of itself, it'd be pretty easy to do. And could you list five positive things about our country? That'd be pretty easy to do. But we live in a very challenging world, a very challenging society. And I will say that these last four months that we've gone through seems to have just amplified the problems all the more. And I will, on one hand, I like to say it doesn't make a bit of sense why it would be this bad. But then on the other hand, I know why it is. You know, one, one of the biggest things, and I don't talk much about this because to me it's, it's a non-issue anymore. You know, when you go back in our nation in and of itself, you go back 50, 60 years, racism or prejudice was a bad thing. It was a rampant thing. I mean, I, I grew up in Jonesboro, Georgia, that was still one of the later holdouts. There was one restaurant there that probably 10 years earlier had a little bit of a segregation issue. So when I look back on what we've left behind, I'm thinking, hey, we're in a good place. Now, are, are, are there still idiots in the world who think that, that their, their nationality is so much superior to everybody else's? Well, yeah. But as a whole, we've left that behind us. Until recently. And I don't think it's the nation as a whole. I really think that we have individuals, and they are taking things that are quite unjust, and I'll agree with that. There are problems that have got to be solved. There's sin within the camp of our nation everywhere we look. It just, I mean, pick any corner of the country and it's there. But it troubles me to see the division that's developing within our nation on a political level, and the church has nothing to do with politics, by the way, but on neighborhoods, communities, cities, everywhere we look, there's a problem. And there are people who are problem solvers, and then there are people who are problem causers. And so this morning I decided what we would do is do a two-part lesson, and it just works out that it's going to fall on today, since we'll be meeting again at 5 o'clock. And the lesson is, what is the solution? Now, someone said, now you're going to bring a religious slant into this, and so that's going to skew everything. Well, if, if you were to have a cure for disease and you were to go to the doctor... And the doctor says, here's the cure. Would you listen to him? And I'm not a doctor. But I've got the Bible right here. And you'll find that in, when everything is said and done, all things being equal, and there are always exceptions to the rules, all things being equal, the Bible contains the solution to the problems that we are having in our country today. And so let me start with the first one. We'll look at three this morning and three this afternoon. The first one begins with something that, to me, is obvious. And this is probably one of the areas that people will scoff at the most. Love the Lord. This is where we start in our text this morning of Mark chapter 12. And there's a reason why this is so important. In Mark chapter 12, let's begin our reading uh, there in verse, let's start in verse 29. These people asked Jesus, what was the first commandment? Of all. And Jesus said, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Now let's start there with verse 30. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Brethren, I would suggest that this is the first step. Because what this does, this brings an individual's focus and in life into a standard that offers enough course corrections that not only will improve the individual's life, but will improve the life of everyone who abides by this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, 
and with all your strength. Now we have a standard. And you have to have a standard in any civilization, in any society. There are acceptable standards, and there are unacceptable standards. When you go all the way back to the Hammurabi's Code, around, I think it's 2000 B.C., I could be get off a couple hundred years there, here we have a code that sets up a very strong standard that clearly comes from the Lord as far as what is instilled within the hearts of men, and when you compare that to what God gave on Mount Sinai to the children of Israel, it makes sense. There's a standard. We know how to be better. And if we will love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, then it will set us on the proper path that will do nothing for us but make us, that's not the right way to word that, but we'll say it anyway. The best thing it will do for us, and the worst thing, it will make us the best people we could possibly be. Because there's a standard by which we are to live. Think about Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. If we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus talks about the importance of obeying the Lord. And so he says here that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And he goes on there with a great example of this. So for me, the first step is I need to love God with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I follow his standard. I do as he tells me to do through his word. I knew a preacher. Now, let me, I won't go there. I will say this. I have known very negative examples in the past set by Christians. And I'm like, how in the world do you do that? How do you live the way you live, and how do you say the things that you say when you also, out of the same mouth, say, I love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength? How do you do that? It cannot be done. One is a lie, and the other is, well, it's a lie as well, isn't it? How can you say to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? James words it a little bit differently. How can you say that you love God and hate your brother? Okay, you cannot do both at the same time. So if we love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we will listen to the things that he tells us, and we will abide by those things. And if you want a good set of instructions, and we're going to look at this here in just a moment, if you want a good set of instructions on how to deal with other people, look at the Sermon on the Mount. It was pointed out to me some time back that when you look at the majority of the teachings of Christ, the majority of his teachings have to deal with how we deal with other people. Now that's a very good point. I hadn't really thought about it. When you look at the Sermon on the Mount, just take Matthew's account for it, and you go through and you look at the various things that Jesus puts and deals with, you'll find a good portion, if not the majority of them, have to do with how we treat other people, how we deal with one another, even how we deal with those people who hate us. And so that brings me to the next point. If we want to solve the problems in the world, and this has been mentioned, especially at the beginning of the outbreak, we need to love our neighbor. This is very important. Now this one, even people who don't believe in God can get behind. Because there is a practical standard that is established when we, when we choose to love our neighbors as ourselves. This takes us back to, Matthew, to Mark chapter 12, there in verse 31. Now remember what Jesus said, the second of the commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. Let's start there. If I love my neighbor as myself, and I got to tell you, I love myself pretty good, then I love my neighbor pretty good as well. And that's kind of the, the, the fundamental principle, the way that things should work. When we treat, when we deal with other people, we should deal with other people in the way that we ourselves would want to be treated. It is pure selfishness to treat someone else in a way that you yourself would never fathom being treated. You wouldn't tolerate it at all. We are told to love our neighbors as ourself. Turn now to Luke chapter 6. Luke records a very similar wording to what Matthew did, but I want to consider Luke chapter 6 and his account of this beginning in verse 27. Let's, let's read through here, and there's a couple of key things I want us to point out. And I'm telling you, anybody in the world can apply these teachings. 
As long as you're willing to be selfless and willing to love others as you love yourself. He says, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, do also to them for them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies, do good, and lend hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Let's pause there. Did you notice that one statement he said there in verse 35, the last part of it? Even in preparing this sermon, I overlooked this statement. And now it jumps out at me. For He that is God is kind to the unthankful and the evil. Think about that for a moment. That's not talking about us, is it? Before we became Christians? Could that have possibly described us? Well, sure. We were lost in sin. Some people, their lives were lived in such a way that they weren't bad people, but they were still separated from God by sin. Others, they were, if we would put it on human terms, they were really bad. But God forgave them. He showed mercy. He showed mercy to those whom we probably would not. He's kind to the unthankful and evil. So let's break this down a little bit. The first one begins with the love your enemy rule. It's a very strong principle. You love your enemy. Now, I know that goes counterintuitive to the world that we live in today. The very idea of enemy is someone who is opposite to you, who wants to hurt you, who is against you. How could you possibly love them? How could that possibly be the solution? And therein, that's when it becomes the perfect solution. Study arguments, study conflicts, and study and look and see how, how escalating situations are de-escalated, if you would. Look and see what happens. You know, uh, many times you hear about road rage. What would it take to de-escalate a road rage moment? Well, one, stay in your car. But what about loving your enemies yourself? When an individual sets themselves in a position to where they are capable of loving their enemies, of doing good unto their enemies, then they have now put themselves into a position to be able to properly deal with most situations. For instance, he says, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who spitefully use you. I didn't see much of that when I was in high school. I, didn't see, I don't see much of that in the world today when people really get mad at one another and start yelling at one another. But among Christians, this is, a, this is the solution. To him who strikes you on one cheek, offer the other also. Our lives as Christians is not about retaliation. We could jump over to Romans chapter 12. We realize that we are to let God be the judge, let God render vengeance, not ourselves. Our responsibility is to do our best as much as lies within, as Paul writes in Romans 12, be at peace with all men. And this begins with us adopting the attitude where we love our enemy. We're going to render to them the things that are good. We're not going to render to them the things that are bad. And just as God is kind to the unthankful and evil, even so too should we be. But look at the next thing seen within this. This we call the golden rule. Do unto others. Let's look, let's look at this. what does it exactly say here. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. All righty. Well, how, how simple of a concept is that? You know, I'm over at your house, and I see you've got something that I really wanted. And you're not monitoring. It's a $100 bill lying there on the table. It'd be real easy. I could just read over there and grab it, put it in my pocket, and a couple of days later, you would turn to one of your kids and say, who took my money? 
You're going to blame them first. And you never know that I did it. But what if I paused for a moment and said, how would I like it if they did that to me? Well, I could either answer that one of two ways. <laughs> I don't care. I'm going to go ahead and do it. Or, which would probably be more likely, yeah, I'd hate that. And so we need to stop and think about the way that we respond to other people. If the world would do this, if everything that is being thrown about on the news, if everything in the political arena, and, and even, you know, I don't mind protests. I really don't. They serve a purpose, and they've affected change. But when it becomes a riot, then this is what you've got to think about this. How would I like it if a bunch of people came down my neighborhood and broke out my windows, trashed my cars, and things such as that, all in the name of a cause? Then I would think for a minute, I'm going to put the brick down, I'm not going to throw it. It's the idea that we do unto others as we would have them do unto us. The next thing there is let's be merciful. Now, being merciful doesn't mean that you excuse wrongdoing. Being merciful doesn't mean that you justify wrongdoing. It just means that you're willing to show mercy to someone who's in need of mercy. Someone who is willing, who, again, go back to the idea of doing good unto others. If someone was to break into your house and they were to scare your family horribly bad, and then as they're running out of the house, they trip on your front step and fall and crack their head, how quickly could you remember 911? You know, it'd be easy to say, what's that number we're supposed to call? Well, I'll call it in a minute. Husband, you put things off a lot. Put this one off a little bit longer. You know, what, what should we do? Immediately you seek help for them. But they just harmed me. They just scared my family. They did all these bad things to me. Yeah, that's right. But they deserve mercy just as you deserve mercy. And so we do that. We exercise this attitude of mercy. Then he also says in verse 37, let's read the next couple of verses here real quick. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven, in verse 37. 38 says, give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be put into your bosom. For the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. So there's the first thing in this section. We need to remember not to judge, not to condemn, but to forgive. Now someone says, wait a minute, what about righteous judgment? Christ ain't talking about that. Well, what if I'm, my brother's overtaken in a fault? Am I not supposed to go to him and talk to him? That's not what Jesus is talking about. It is the idea, the attitude here, where we, take, where we are not going to take upon ourselves God's role. We're going to be willing to forgive. We're going to be willing to say, if this person repents to God, I'll forgive him. I'm not going to hold this against him. And it's the idea there of judge not and condemn not. God will take care of that. And something that is wrong is wrong. But you have a lot of people who, who raise their head up in judgment of other people for matters they have no business becoming judges of. They have nothing to do with this. And if we want to deal with one another properly, we need to be willing to forgive one another, be merciful to one another, do unto others as we would have them to do unto us, love our enemies, and as the last one says, be willing to help. You know, a lot of the problems in the world might be fixed if more people were willing to help. Might be fixed. I would love to say that our world is extremely simple, and we can run a line of statistics and say, hey, here, it, 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 is, it is this simple to fix. But you and I know that's not true. If we had a community of 10, we might could probably hammer out some, some problems. But when you have a community of millions of people, it's very challenging. So if every individual will step back and adopt this policy, this standard of living and dealing with people, I really, would, I really believe that things would begin to improve. And one more along this same line... Let's not be a respecter of persons. I know this can be difficult at times. I really do. We all are very opinionated. Some might be more opinionated than others. I don't know. And I'm not judging you on that either. But turn over to James chapter 2. We have to remember that it's not within our right to be the respecter of persons. This is God's role to be. Notice in James chapter 2 verses 8 and 9. 
And there is a very specific context to this, okay? And I, I recognize that. He says in James chapter 2, verse 8, if you, fulfill, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. Now notice that, we talked about that, all right? If you love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. So the way I deal with everybody needs to be the way I deal with everybody. And I realize it's hard at times. I understand that. And Peter himself, an apostle of Christ, was not perfect and showed partiality to the Jews of the circumcision over the, the converted Gentiles. But this is a standard that we are to be striving to obtain. So we have loved the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. But what about the third of our sixth step in this process of solving the world's issues? Well, it might not go that far. What's the, what's the next one? You've got to respect the law of the land. I mean, this is it. This, uh, to me, this is one of those obvious ones. When I would be turning over to Romans chapter 13, when I was a kid, I was taught to respect the law of the land. You know, I don't re ever remember traveling with my dad and him grumbling because he chose to exceed the speed limit and the police officer pulling him over. My kids years ago got to ride with an individual who the whole trip berated the police officers because he couldn't speed because if he did, he would get a ticket in front of his children, just berating them right and left. Listen, we are of the responsibility and obligation to respect the law of the land. Someone says, yeah, but what if it's a bad government? We'll go back and live during the time of the Roman Empire and tell me how much different it is from today. You'll probably find it's a lot more, maybe worse, than what we live in today. Matter of fact, we live in a great nation. Compare our nation to other countries. There are many countries out there that are ran by religion itself. You don't want to live in that type of country because of the persecution that falls upon the people, especially those who believe in God. Romans chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. The Apostle Paul says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. Now notice that. Notice what he says. If you do evil. I mean, it's that simple. If you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers, attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Now that's very simple. You respect the law of the land. Peter says submit unto the governing authorities there. Now, I, you'll hear a lot of these what-if situations. You know, well, what if, if, like in this case, what if you got bad police officers? Well, they need to be dealt with, according to the law of the land. All right, justice needs to be served. I'm not saying justice doesn't need to be served, but when everything is said and done, you respect the law of the land. When, when, I, was, when I was young, and some of y'all who are my age and older will remember this, when I was in high school... We were right on the end of fearing the Cold War. There was always talk about Russia being the one to come over. And the next World War is coming. A lot of talk about that. And, I, and, and, and growing up in the South, yes, Georgia was still holding on to the old Confederate flag and everything like that and everything. I remember having kids, and boy, if I woke up and I was under a, a Russia flag, I'd take my gun out and kill all of them I could. And I thought, man, how can Christians be that way? If you wake up under the flag of another government, guess who this passage now applies to? The government you're living under. Notice what I said, if you wake up and you're under their, their rule. That's, that's the point. Paul doesn't give any stipulations. What if it's a bad government? What if it's a good government? What if it's a terrible government? 
He just says as Christians we have a responsibility to be in subjection to the law of the land. It's that simple. Now, this is not to be any type of uh, a political speech, but i tell you what I like about our government. You don't like the current president? Wait 48 years and he's gone. And it works that way, doesn't it? There was only one president, I think, that served 12 years a number of years ago. And they got rid of that. So if you don't like your current representative, give him two, four, six years, whatever it is. And if he gets voted out, you're not going to see him again. That's the beauty of our system. And accountability is very great until it's not. And that's what all the protests were about. It was about situations that should have been dealt with properly and fairly. You know, things that were out of control statistically in a proportional basis there. So all the people were wanting in some ways was the fairness. Okay, we've got a great system. Let's get that in check. But for Christians, for Christians, we must not allow anything that goes on in our government to ever put us to the point to say, well, I don't have to submit to my government. Because then we're not submitting to whom? To God. Okay? So just keep that in mind. Um, what about 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 2? What if someone says, what if I don't like my government? There was a Christian. Or not, let me rephrase that. There was a, there was a fellow years ago lived in an Islamic nation, Islamically controlled nation. And he began to learn the truth. And a lot of individuals got in contact with him through the course of time via the Internet. And this young man finally came to the decision he wanted to become a Christian. And there were other people who had more contact with him than I did, but I had one small conversation with him. I found out that there was a member of the church, a preacher, who lived over in another city in this country. And I, so I contacted him, I emailed him, and I said, would you be willing to travel over to this city and baptize this person? He wants to be a Christian. You know what the preacher said to me? He says, I can't do it. I've already been arrested several times for preaching the truth, and I don't know, he could be a representative of the state setting up a trap for me. So... I, I wrote to the Christian over here. I said, I found out there's this preacher over here. Is there any way you could travel over there and see him? He says, how do I know he's not a representative of the state waiting to trap me? Because he feared for his life. Now, he ultimately was baptized because two Christians did travel over to this country, and they were able to meet with him and baptize him. And now he's no longer in the country. He's moved out, been able to go and go into college here, and now he's doing very well. We don't live in that type of nation. And so we need to thank God that we don't. And we need to be thankful for the government that we do have and pray for them. That's what Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 2. We need to pray for our leaders. And what should be the focus of our prayer? Lord, I pray the Republicans will win in this next election. Or Democrats, if that's your choice. No, that's not the prayer. I guess you could if you wanted to. But what does Paul say? Pray that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life in serving God. That's what's most important, okay? That is what we need to focus on. If you want to get involved in the other things, that's fine. Just do so as a Christian, as a faithful child of God. But let's keep things in proper perspective. And I tell you, if the world would do this, at least in my opinion, if the world would have this respect for the law of the land, then it would be a lot better place. And this is what we need to teach our children. It's, it's real simple. If you don't want to pay a high ticket for speeding, then what do you not do? Well, don't speed. It's that simple. If you don't want to go to jail, then you don't break the law. I mean, it's, it's simple. You know, you have these individuals who are arrested because they've been breaking the law, and there's evidence they broke the law. And so what do they do is they contact an attorney because this is how great our system is. And the, the attorney says, all right, look, you're innocent until proven guilty, so how do you want to plead? Well, clearly I'm not guilty. I mean, there's security footage, <laughs> there's fingerprints, but I didn't do it. And that's the beauty of our system, trial by your peers. But if you never want to be in that place, then what's the secret? Don't break the law. I mean, and, and, and again, we're not living in a country that says, look, in order to, to serve God, I've got to break the law. We don't live in that country, do we? No, we don't live in that type of country. And so, that's the third solution. 
respect the law of the land and teach our kids to respect the law of the land and, and help the law of the land to deal with itself when it doesn't abide by the principles it needs to. We can do that as citizens. We have that responsibility and that op the um, opportunity in the country we live in. Well, I think that's enough for now. Three things, and that the first one is the greatest. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself, the second one, and then respect the law of the land. Tonight, we're going to consider three more things that will help be a solution to the problems that we face in our world today. And I know, realistically, that most of the world's not going to follow these things. I know that, but we can. And we can influence other people. We can be the light that shines in the world. That's our responsibility as children of God. I'll tell you ahead of time, we're going to look at three things tonight, and the three things are, you've got to get your homes in order. You need to have a respect for life, and you, lead, you need to learn to work hard. So, you know, if, you're not, if you can't make it tonight, well, there it is in a nutshell. It'll be better if you're able to hear the lesson, obviously. If you're not a Christian, let me leave you with this. We live in a world today that doesn't respect God. Okay, we understand that. But your salvation lies in the grasp of our Heavenly Father. If you're not a Christian and you recognize that the sins in your past have separated you from God and you desire to spend eternity with God in heaven, you can, you can become one of His children today. Now, there's a standard that comes with that. And, it, and you know, we talk about believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repenting of your sins, and be buried with Him in baptism. You rise up then to walk in newness of life. You put off the old man, you put on the new man, and that new man has a standard by which we are all to live. You make that commitment to become a child of God, and you do so, then you have a great standard by which to live your life and to spend eternity with God in heaven. If you are a Christian, you've not been living faithfully, and only you know the reason why. I would encourage you to see the need to turn back to God in humble repentance. Ask Him to forgive you of your sins and be restored back to His fellowship. If you're subject to the Gospel's call and invitation, come forward as we stand and as we sing.